Well, how many times have you heard those skeptical of the vaccine asking how scientists were able to develop a jab in just under a year? In the past, vaccines took years to develop. So what's the difference this time around? Well, uh, Shabir Mahdi, professor of vaccinology at FITS, was part of the vaccine research and development. He joins us now to unpack this. Uh, Prof Mahdi, thank you uh, so much for your time. Uh, so what do you say to the people who don't trust the vaccine because it was developed at such great speed? So I think what we need to appreciate is that the reason why this vaccine was developed within a space of 10 and a half months is multifactorial. But foremost is that the technology that was used to develop the vaccine is not technology that was recently discovered. It's technology that has been in existence for a long, long time. When it comes to, as an example, in non-replicating vector-based vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, as an example, uh, the technology that was used to develop that vaccine was actually already been used previously, way back in 2002, to develop vaccines against SARS-CoV-1. So what essentially happened is that we were able to use technology that was already existing. We were able to adapt it very quickly and then uh, start the process of developing a vaccine against COVID. Now, in addition to that, uh, the amount of investment and the amount of scientific expertise that has gone into developing a COVID vaccine is unprecedented. So in the past, what usually happens is that companies are responsible for developing a vaccine, and they're very cautious uh, from going from one stage to another, and usually things take place in series. Uh, in addition to which, they're obviously needing to use shareholders' money to essentially uh, produce a vaccine. So they sort of delay before going to another stage, trying to have a certain level of certainty that they're going to be successful. What happened this time around, in addition to scientists coming together from a number of different fields, starting to work on a vaccine, government started to take on the financial risk. And they were prepared to invest billions of dollars to get scientists to start working and to get companies to start uh, working on developing a vaccine without any sort of fear that there would be financial repercussions to the company should the vaccine not actually materialize. So essentially, it's a completely different sort of playing ground, a playing field when it comes to what happened that assisted us to develop a COVID-19 vaccine within a 10 and a half month period rather than 10 and a half years. Now, that doesn't mean that in any way there were shortcuts that were taken to develop a vaccine. Uh, although the studies, the phase one, phase two, phase three, which is sort of technical terms, but that is how these studies roll out. Although the studies took place in parallel, there was a huge amount of uh, regulatory scrutiny uh, when looking at the conduct of the studies. Uh, as an example, in South Africa, I've been involved in vaccine research for the past 25 years. And usually, SAPRA, the regulatory authority, would require you to submit a report every six months on the conduct of the study. When we did COVID vaccine studies in South Africa, SAPRA were insisting that we actually provide updates of the study every two weeks. And they were reviewing our study every two weeks rather than every six months. So there was tremendous regulatory oversight of the study. But at the end of the day, it's because of the huge amount of human resource as well as um, financial investment that was made uh, into the program that assisted us to get the vaccine developed within, in less than 12 months. Uh, Prof. Mahdi, let me, let, me, let me try and see if I, if I understand exactly what you've said there. Let me summarize it very quickly. So the first thing is that this technology, the vaccine technology, is not new. It's been around for decades and it was just tweaked slightly in order to tackle the coronavirus, to tackle SARS-CoV-2. That's the first thing you're saying. Uh, the second thing you're saying is that because everyone was pulling in the same direction, financially and in terms of human resources, we were able to go through the different phases of the trial in a faster pace. And the third thing is that unlike what people think that there was red tape that was uh, that was cut and corners that were cut that there's actually more regulation for the the covid-19 vaccines and and more checking uh, to to see if the side effects could be detrimental uh, absolutely certainly in south africa in the united states and elsewhere it has been a completely different sort of framework that the regulatory authorities used to oversee these studies, the conduct of these studies. And there was really real-time evaluation of what was happening, unlike in the past, where the sort of evaluation takes place on a less uh, frequent basis. So the intensity of scrutiny by the regulatory authorities 
in the studies that are conducted in South Africa as well as elsewhere is simply unprecedented as well. There have been reports, though, of people who have passed away after receiving the vaccine. Are those reports exaggerated? That, I think, is a concern that many people have, is that, well, you hear things that have been peddled online that so there are 30 people that have passed away after receiving the vaccine. Correct. And that 30 people, as an example, is in the context of 11 million doses of vaccine have been being administered in South Africa. That is not to say that any of the 30 deaths were actually due to the vaccine either. Uh, SAPRA has reviewed uh, at least in eight of those deaths and they've concluded that none of those deaths were associated with vaccine, due to the vaccine. One of the challenges that we face when rolling out COVID-19 vaccines, especially when uh, we are experiencing a resurgence and at a peak of the resurgence, is that a high percentage of people that are being vaccinated unknowingly are actually infected with the virus at that point in time. And that was our experience when we did the initial study of the AstraZeneca vaccine, where up to 15% of uh, participants that were completely asymptomatic when they got their first dose of vaccine, when we tested them, uh, coincidentally, they were testing positive uh, for the virus. They were actually infected with the virus. So unfortunately, what happens when you are vaccinating at a peak of a resurgence, many people are already infected to the virus unknowingly. They get a vaccine and a few days later, they end up with COVID and they die of COVID. And the reason for that is not because the vaccine caused the COVID, but rather because that's a natural progression of an infection which they did not know that they were actually harboring at a time when they were receiving the vaccine. So when there is a death occurring immediately after vaccination, even if it's because of COVID or any other cause, that doesn't necessarily infer that vaccination is the cause of the death. There's a temporal association, but that doesn't infer causality. To infer causality, you need to do a more in-depth analysis as to the circumstances of their death, and ideally to actually uh, do some sort of post-mortem sampling as well. Well, Prof. Mahdi, thank you so much for clearing that up, and hopefully we've, uh, we've managed to convince a few of the skeptics. Uh, Shabir Mahdi, Professor of Vaccinology and the Dean of Health Sciences at Wits University. Well, staying with